We're going to be covering introduction to laser beam profiling. My name is Russ Lakis. I'm an engineer at Ophir Spirecon in Logan, Utah in the United States. If you have any questions, you can contact our product support department. We're going to be talking about camera-based beam profilers. The most predominant profiler product on the market and so we're going to talk about why camera-based laser me measurement is so important. What are they? How do they really work? And then which product that Ophir has that can help you. When you're putting a laser to work, the laser really needs to be monitored to make sure it's working at its best. When you acquire a new laser system, often it's uncertain whether or not the laser really meets the spec sheet. Laser systems do degrade over time. They wear out, like most things. And when that happens, manufacturing quality and yields often decrease. Uh, we have a lot of customers that come to us uh, for the first time because they have been using a laser system for manufacturing. Um, yields are being affected. They know it's something wrong with the laser, but they just don't know what. In the laboratory, sometimes either new lasers or lasers for other research may have an unexpected uncertainty that doesn't seem to match the expectations. These two slides here are a case from a few years back. It was an industrial YAG laser failing manufacturing process. We went in and set up our LBA beam profiler system at the time. And within minutes, we were able to get live data, get everything aligned, and see immediately that the laser cavity was out of tune. So live, the laser technician was able to adjust that to the image on the right. They had fixed their problem. That was a good success story. Um, this is an example of some various dental curing lamps in the UV. How these are used, a UV sensitive adhesive that will be applied to the uh, dental work. And then all it takes is uh, UV light to make that adhesive cure. And there was a lot of variability um, in how this curing process was taking place. And it really depended on what curing lamp was being used. And so you can see very readily how six different products claiming to do the same thing in the end really were not. Intensity and the power output of each lamp and then the spatial uh, distribution of that energy was different in every case. So we're going to cover a few key terms and definitions. First of all, for a camera-based system, when we talk about an image sensor, we're talking about an electronic device that converts an optical image to electronic signals. And they are comprised of an array of pixels. A pixel is the smallest addressable element of an image sensor. The origin of that word is picture element. And so it's just that one small little piece of the, the sensor. When we talk about beam width or beam diameter, often those terms are used interchangeably. There is a technical difference between the two, but that doesn't really matter for anything we're going to be talking about. A beam width or a beam diameter works just fine. The length or diameter along any specified line that is perpendicular to the beam axis and intersects it. So we're going to be putting the camera directly in line with the laser and shining the laser spot onto the camera sensor. And when we do that, we are going to need some attenuation, which is a gradual loss of intensity through any kind of flux through a medium. And there are several ways that you go about that. A beam profiling system is comprised of several components. First of all, a digital camera. But any old digital camera will not work for laser measurement. There are specific criteria that we use to validate cameras for use in our beam profiling systems because there are just a lot of sensors out there that just aren't designed to do the type of the measurement that we're trying to do. We need something that's very linear. The spatial uniformity is very high. Sensor quality has to be very high and, and more. The interfaces to the computer, uh, currently the predominant ones are USB 2.0 or USB 3.0. With USB 3.0 cameras, you do get faster frame rates, so there is an advantage to that. Gigabit Ethernet is another fast interface, but it's a little less plug and play. Like in USB, you can just plug it in and it works. Gigabit Ethernet requires a little bit of configuration 
kind of like what you would do for configuring a network. But after that, once they're configured, they work very well and the frame rates are very good. But you will need a computer, preferably one with a dedicated graphics card because in beam profiling systems are trying to visualize a lot of data and that, that is costly if you just let your CPU handle that. So when shopping for a beam profiling system, make sure that you are going to pair that with a computer that has some sort of dedicated graphics card. On the optical side of things, you may be using various lenses um, for expansion or reduction of your laser. Attenuation be, being ND filters, maybe wedges and prisms, and you might be moving the beam around using mirrors. Additionally, depending on what powers you're using or what you're interested in, you may be also using beam dumps and power meters. A lot of times, you can use an Ophir power meter as your beam dump, and so you get both the power measurement out of it and you're able to capture that signal and, and make sure everything is safe in your working environment. So back to camera pixels, exactly what is a pixel? How does it work? To demonstrate that, we're going to look at kind of an unusual demonstration, but in the, the picture here, we have an array of cardboard boxes, just square cardboard boxes, and we've been throwing marbles into that array. Each pixel, each box, is an image sensor which converts a number of photons striking the element into an electrical charge. It stores that up, and then at intervals, those charges are all read out. The quantum efficiency of the sensor, if you're looking at, at cameras and have been looking at them, you'll notice quantum efficiency is, is one of the numbers you see. That is the relationship of how many photons it takes to produce electrical charge. So if we take our marbles and count them up, we're going to get some, some data not so different from a laser beam profile. Once that charge is read out, we get a f camera frame or a picture. Not any different from what you take with your phone on your camera. But in this case, we're hoping to only look at the laser signal. On a larger scale, uh, we use this to generate a spatially accurate profile of the laser intensity. Camera profilers are really great because of the mechanically finite nature of the pixels. They don't move, they don't change, they don't have to be calibrated because there's nothing you can calibrate on, on them. They're going to be the same in two years as they are the day, first day that you get your camera. However, the pixels, because they are so small, they are delicate and they can be easily damaged. Additionally, the total dynamic range, which is the difference, the ratio between the highest signal and the lowest signal, is still a lot less than some other profiling devices we'll talk about later called scanning slit profilers. Camera-based systems require attenuating optics into the beam path. If you look at our, our catalog, you'll see that there are a bunch of different cameras. And you might ask, why are there so many? What's the difference between them? The first big difference is the electromagnetic spectrum, that different materials provide electrical responses at different wavelengths. These cameras, our SP900 series and our LT665 series, they're USB 3 cameras. Our 11059 and our Ziva cameras are a USB 2.0 interface. And our Pyrocam cameras are gigabit Ethernet. Other things to note here, you'll see the sensor format, um, which may not make sense. Um, at first, but that is a industry standard notation for the aspect ratio of uh, and size of that sensor. So like a 35 millimeter format is akin to the 35 millimeter uh, photographic format. The resolution of each camera is posted here. You'll see we have some very low resolution cameras, 0.7 megapixels or 2.8. On the high resolution, we have 6 and 12 megapixels. So these are large format and larger high resolution cameras. Um, but the pixel size is getting bigger as well. So there's some trade-offs to each one of these. So if you have a large beam that you can't really put uh, imaging optics in front of your beam, 
then you might want to get one of the large format cameras to be able to handle that. On the frequency, if you're using a 1064 laser, our silicon CCD cameras, such as the 900 series and the 665, those will work pretty well at. But you can also detect that using an in-gas sensor, but it's a lot more expensive. So there are trade-offs in each case, and if you really aren't sure what you need, then we have a great sales team that can help you find exactly the right product for your application. The camera generates a spatial intensity profile, is what we call it. it. Maps out that distribution so you can tell really where all of the energy is and then perform measurements on it. So this is back to our data from our marbles. We can just see the horizontal section and a vertical section. If we take those and just look at a row and column of data, you generate a 1D beam profiler. And so in this case, this is a 960 micron YAG laser, so a fairly large spot. And we're looking at just the column and row of data along these dotted lines, along the cursor in our beam gauge software. And then that data is plotted here. The red dashed lines show us where the beam width was measured for this laser. You can also do measurements on a 2D or a two-dimensional data set. And a lot of the calculations we provide do look at the data in a 2D view. And then we do provide a three-dimensional view as well, which doesn't really provide a computational advantage, but it does help you as a user spot defects or aberrations in your laser really effectively. And so that's a really handy tool. So of course the mean of it, everyone wants to know what the numbers are. What is my beam width? How much is it changing? Where is my centroid? Things like that. Uh, beam gauge collects data and performs computational analysis on more than 70 different measurement results. We have result statistics, pass-fail process control, and time charts built into the software. And with beam gauge, we follow all applicable ISO standards for laser beam profiling that are available. So when there isn't a standard available, we do have some non-ISO industry favorites that we include as well, such as percent of peak. That's a very popular measurement, but it's not ISO. So it's pretty widely accepted, but there can be some flaws with how that works, and so it's not selected for the ISO standard. One feature that's unique to beam gauge is that if you or someone you know is knowledgeable in programming, they can actually add your own calculations into beam gauge as if they were natively one that we created. So custom calculations then get all of the native features such as statistics, pass fails, and time charts, just like any other result in beam gauge. You won't see a difference in how that works. Here's a comprehensive list of the various results that uh, you'll see in beam gauge. It's kind of a daunting list at first, but uh, in reality, you're really probably only gonna use a small set of these depending on your application. We have power energy results dealing with just the intensity, your total power, how high your peak is or your minimum, how much of the power is in the aperture. We have divergence measurements, and we have tools for helping you measure divergence as a test procedure. Spatial results, we have centroid or center of mass, peak location, a variety of beam widths and diameters. For example, four sigma, knife edge. We have pre-programmed a 1090 clip level the ISO 1684 clip level, or you can program your own. Percent of peak method, the ISO moving slit method, which looks, it looks at the data similar to how a scanning slit device would measure a laser beam. Percent of total energy is also very popular. Encircle power smallest slit, encircle power smallest aperture, and some related ones, we have a couple linear distance measurements. Cursor to crosshair, for example, you can put our cursor in one location and the crosshair to another and get a linear distance uh, from those two tools. And if your beam is elliptical and rotated, you can find out information about that as well. Gaussian results, 
if you're trying to compare against uh, real Gaussian, if you're working with top hat beams and some of these measurements, there's no, no comparison for them. And those are all ISO standard results. And then we have information about what the frame, uh, the frame of data is uh, or what it was at the time. And we maintain that some of that's useful for a lot of post-processing analysis. Beam gauge also provides ISO compliant beam positional stability monitoring. It's built in, you can export the data. I also load the data back in if you want to look at it later. And all of those adhere to ISO 11670. So I want to talk about a couple of best practices for camera-based measurement. One of the most essential things is ensuring that you have a good baseline in your, your data frame. And what we mean by that is that if you don't have a closed optical system, you might have ambient light. The camera, by nature, induces electronic noise into the frame. We want to be able to exclude that from the measurement to ensure that what we're really measuring is just the positive signal from the laser. So methods which might clip the baseline, they, they remove real laser signal usually, and then you typically undermeasure the beam. So in beam gauge, our patented baseline calibration is called UltraCal. And over the years, occasionally we have people that say, well, you know, it's just, it's not really necessary, but I can show you why it is. UltraCal will help with the random electronic noise, any ambient light. It also helps with temperature change, especially with silicon CCDs. Silicon reacts very sensitively to the thermal environment in which it's in. And when it gets hotter, it'll produce more electronic signal and when it gets colder, it will produce less. And so even just air currents in a room can start to affect your measurement. And so to do that, you want to take care of that by running UltraCal before any important measurement. So here we have a, just a dark current CCD frame. And if we look at the histogram of uh, you know, the distribution of that data, it's all above the zero point. And any CCD camera that you get, you're going to notice that you can't ever get below zero. And that can be a problem because you don't have a way of neutralizing it. So when UltraCal runs, it takes a look frame data and then does a intelligent subtraction on that data to shift the baseline back down and center that about zero. By doing that, now your baseline is effectively neutral. Then if you turn on your laser, now you're only looking at the real laser signal and not anything else that was in the frame. Some competitive products we've seen use you know, clip levels that just truncate the noise off, but we find that those only leave the positive component and still leave the positive bias uh, from noise or ambient light on the beam. And so we found that those, those systems don't really work very well. The next thing that you want to do is proper application of the built-in software apertures. Beam gauge has two software apertures, which you use and place around your data to isolate the beam signal from the rest of the sensor data. In the picture on the top right, we can see that in this case, we don't really need most of this data frame. It's really just extra. And if there's any thermal drift, like the, the room warms up a little bit, we'll actually see that that, that frame starts affecting the, the beam. So we want to exclude that. First of all, do an UltraCal, and then we, we apply the apertures. The white aperture, which is shown as a square here, you can ch switch it to multiple shapes is good for situations where the beam is not really moving about and the beam width, the beam size really isn't changing. Uh, the auto aperture, the yellow one, is good for dynamic situations. And how that works is we size that to two times a knife edge 90-10 beam width. And that is, it's just a first pass. You don't really see that measurement. And then once we have that aperture placed, 
then all of the calculations which we looked at before get run. You can also use these simultaneously, and how this works is the uh, white aperture restricts the data that will be used to size the, to do that knife edge pass, and that helps rein in the auto aperture even better. And that's recommended whenever possible. If you can apply both and your application allows it, you'll find that your measurements are more repeatable and more accurate because of it. So if you've, if you've ultra-caled and applied the software apertures correctly, that yields the best results. BeamGauge also features a mathematical beam profile generator. Um, it's the only integrated beam modeling tool out there, and it's capable of uh, modeling all of the Laguerre, Hermite, and Donut modes. The reason for doing this is that you can model your ideal laser and then use that for comparison. You can also model an ideal camera using the feature as well if you shut off the laser intensity in the controls. So it's a really flexible tool, a kind of an advanced user feature, but you can do some really cool analytical things with that data. Earlier we talked about laser attenuation. Because the pixels and the, the CCD or, or CMOS arrays are so sensitive, typically you're going to have to reduce the laser intensity down to an acceptable level. And a few ways that we can do that, we provide some stackable C-mount neutral density filters uh, with each camera and more available to, for purchase. If your laser power is a little higher than that, you may want to consider using a beam splitter. We have some that are a C-mount variety that just mount right onto the front of the camera can get some wedges and, and other types of optics that mount separately as well. One of my personal favorites is the LBS 300. The LBS 300 combines a pair of wedges with two slides of the 25 millimeter C-mount filters, but they're just mounted right into the slides. So you have four different ND filters in these slides, so two in each slide. You have a really flexible system for higher power uh, laser systems. So when attenuating, we would recommend that you try and reach 70 to 95% of the saturation level or, or the dynamic range of the camera. So if we consider the color bar on the right side of the, the 2D beam display as the dynamic range of the camera, we want that to be in kind of the orange and yellow section. And by doing that, we increase the signal to noise ratio for the beam profile measurements. That allows a repeatable and reliable result and the greatest accuracy of the beam. If, you, if your laser is not as intense and you just can't get to that level, that's okay. Beam gauge, if you've used ultra cal and you've applied apertures correctly, then beam gauge can accurately measure below 30% of the dynamic range, though the uncertainty starts to increase a little bit. But it definitely can do it. You also have tools in beam gauge, such as frame summing, where you can then boost that signal back up artificially by summing multiple frames together. It slows down your frame rate to do so, like if you summed three frames together, then every three frames will be one and your frame rate is now 30% of what it was. But it's a really great solution for those that need that. Uh, we talked about power measurement just a little bit. Beam gauge actually does allow combining Ophir power meters and power sensors directly into the software. So you can get a live power calibration of your laser at the same time you're getting spatial measurements. It accommodates the full range of Ophir sensors. Um, also works with pulsed lasers. If you're looking to integrate beam measurements into your own tools or your own product, Beam Gauge Professional provides an automation interface via .NET, and the languages that work best with that are C Sharp, VB.NET, C++ CLI, 
or LabVIEW. On the right hand side, right bottom right hand corner, you can see this is the demo that we do provide with uh, the product for LabVIEW. So right out of the box, you can get started and uh, seeing how that data can be pulled out and consumed in your own applications. We provide examples for all of these languages. We have great support uh, for that feature. So in summary, camera profilers can measure lasers accurately in one, two, or three dimensions due to the very finite resolution of their sensors. Different cameras are sensitive to different wavelengths. They provide different acquisition speeds and different resolutions. And uh, so there are a lot of different options for your application. Cameras do require attenuation accessories. You have to use some sort of attenuation, otherwise you're going to damage the sensor. Each optical accessory placed in the beam path can modify the appearance of the beam if it's not used correctly. So you do want to be careful to follow the instructions for the, the optical accessories that you're using. The products we have that do this are Beam Mic, that's the entry level camera profiler. The Beam Gauge Standard is you know, our, our flagship product, but there are some additional features that you get in Beam Gauge Professional. It's good if you're kind of a laser guru or you need some of the additional measurements that are provided there, or if you need those automation capabilities. If you're working in the UV to uh, IR, we have the SP907 and 928. SP300 camera. The SP920G is a new gigabit Ethernet silicon CCD. And then the 11059 and LT665 are our large format options, being 35 millimeter and one inch formats, respectively. If you need to work up in the 1550 nanometer range, we have a couple of options. We have our 900 series camera or our one inch format camera with a special phosphor coating applied right onto the silicon sensor, which allows you to convert the 1550 light to visible light where that the camera can detect it. That loses a little bit of resolution, but it's a really great budget option for 1550, where the other option, the next option, is our Ziva in-gas camera. And those tend to be a little more expensive, but they don't suffer the same penalties as, as using the phosphor coating. So there's a bit of trade-off depending on which product you'd like to use. And then in the low UV or in the CO2 range, you're going to want to be looking at our PyroCam series of pyroelectric sensors. Um, those are made here in Utah. They are a fantastic product. It's unique to Ophir Spyrocon. I do have some helpful links for learning more about um, beam profiling, uh, kind of the ins and outs, and if you want to get a lot deeper into how to do it well and how to do it with beam gauge, then you have some links to do that. This is a four-part series, a real deep dive on uh, camera beam profiling. All of those links and videos are in our Knowledge Center on our website. And we have our videos up on our YouTube site as well. And uh, we've got a ton of videos out there, all sorts of tutorials and educational videos on either various products or how to use various products. So moving on to scanning slit devices. Um, these differ quite a bit from camera-based systems, um, have some advantages over camera systems, and also have some disadvantages versus camera-based systems. Scanning slit laser profilers, uh, we're going to learn about what they are, how they work, why this might be important to you, and then which products that we have that do this type of measurement. So a scanning slit profiler is a device that translates a, a physical slit across the intersection of a laser beam in order to generate a spatial intensity profile. We're going to be measuring beam width or beam diameter as well as other measurements as well. Attenuation can still apply to using this product and we'll talk about the differences there. And then dynamic range is going to come into play. Again, that's the ratio of the smallest signal and the largest signal. 
Hub Scanning Slit Beam Profiling System comprises of a scanning slit device. You're going to need a USB 2.0 interface. You're going to need a computer. Yeah, and a graphics card can help, but for reasons we'll get into, is less important in this product. Uh, there's, there's less visual drawing of, of things with this product is the reason. And then again, optical accessories may still apply, as well as beam dumps and power meters. Our NanoSkin scanning slit profilers are the industry standard scanning slit device. And they include two high precision slits mounted on a rotating drum and a single element power sensor behind that drum. In this image, we have the beam entering the input aperture, and this drum is rotating, and these slits are moved right through the beam. Here's a picture of the drum itself and what the slits look like. The slits are incredibly small and fine. They're, they're rather delicate, but they're a lot more robust than the uh, camera imagers we talked about earlier. If you use a uh, nano scan, this is the, what the front of it looks like, and you're going to want to be careful with the input aperture. And the product does come with a dust cap. You want to use that whenever possible and to reduce any dust collecting in that slit. So as the drum rotates, these two slits that are mounted opposite of each other pass through the beam. And because they're mounted 90 degrees difference from each other, we get two orthogonal beam profiles. Behind that, this disc back here represents the single element sensor. Doesn't really look like that, but this is good representation. On our camera-based systems, the sensor is multi-element. So we get all these little pixels on it. This is a single element sensor. And it's a lot more robust and hardy. Can take a lot more energy without damaging. And so the range of measurement can be up to four times that of a camera-based profiler. So you have a lot greater range where you don't have to attenuate and you can still get a good measurement out of the device and you're still not damaging the device. There are still damage thresholds where you can damage the slit material or even burn through that and then damage the sensor underneath. Our user guide for NanoScan comes with a full, a very comprehensive set of operational range charts. I'll show you one a little bit later. And then some of our models are capable of providing a simultaneous power or, or intensity measurement at the same time. And you can choose that option uh, when you purchase your NanoScan. So how do we use this data? 1D profiles between camera-based profilers and scanning slit profilers generally produce comparable results. This is an important distinction for any of you that might be either switching technologies, you've used one, now you're, you're looking to use the other, or potentially um, using both and trying to compare the results. And this will also help you understand how the data is collected and, and used for calculation. So a 1D profile from a camera measurement that we looked at before is generated by a single row or column of data, just the, like the cursor in beam gauge, we're getting these 1D measurements. In a scanning slit device, a 1D profile is generated by summing all of the energy across the same two-dimensional area. So it's an important distinction because unless your beam is near Gaussian or it's a donut beam, so TEM00 or TEM01 star, then they're not directly comparable as the mode content results fundamentally different 1D profiles. They will differ and it's going to affect your measurement. So if you're looking at a scanning slit, um, scanning slit data versus a camera data and you're seeing that the beam widths don't add up, that's going to be an important distinction while you're looking at that data. As the slit moves past, each row, or in this case column, is one location for that slit. And as the drum spins, it moves to the next location, and we read that signal out again, and we do it over and over and over through the beam, and then we get a 1D profile. A best practice when using a scanning slit uh, device is to axially 
align the device to your laser. If you have a round laser, a round beam, uh, then you don't really have to worry about this as much. But you, you need to determine whether you have a round beam or an ellipt elliptical beam uh, before you really get going. Each device comes with a rotation mount. You want to unlock that thumb screw and rotate um, all the way through the, the range and find the largest beam width and then lock the screw again. Otherwise, your uh, beam width measurements are going to be a little bit misleading as you may not be measuring the widest part of your laser. And it may be inconsistent as well. So if you're doing this, uh, you want to shoot for consistency between either laser units or um, measurements over time. The NanoScan V2 software is our uh, current iteration, and the primary feature of that is the 1D profile data and the results window. There are a lot of additional tools available. The 1D profile data is able to be plotted with submicron accuracy. Earlier when we were talking about camera-based sensors, we were talking about pixels in the range of three or four microns and, and more. In this case, each discrete measurement can be within less than a micron apart from each other. So that's one advantage of using a scanning slit device. And then having two slits on the same drum allows us to measure both the X and the Y simultaneously. In NanoScan V2, we do provide 2D and 3D profiles uh, using um, tomography algorithms to reconstruct what the beam looks like approximately. It's a good visualization, it's a good tool, but you got to realize this is reconstructed data and there are limitations to that. And the reason why is, is this difference here. Instead of looking at every single grid square individually, we're summing those together and looking at a series of 1D profiles, then reconstructing back what the two-dimensional image looks like. It's just a limitation of the technology, but it's really useful for a lot of situations where a camera-based profiler just isn't uh, usable. So we pro provide a whole series of quantitative results, beam width measurements, intensity measurements, tools for measuring divergence through I believe, three different divergence methods. And then you can compare centroid and peak positions and separations. The nanoscan is also capable of measuring up to 16 different beams in the aperture simultaneously. So in this case on screen, I've set up two different ROIs, two different beams, and uh, we're looking at the distance between those or the position and then the distance between those different beams. To protect the sensitive structure of the slit, some lasers will need to be optically attenuated prior to putting those onto a nanoscan. And we do offer a selection of accessories for that. Again, the stackable C-mount filters are really good. But if you're working with very high powers, you're going to want to either reduce the beam before that or use a different product as the, the stackable filters are using an absorbing dark glass which will heat up under higher power lasers. It'll heat up and damage the filter itself. So the other way of do, dealing with that is to use reflective prisms to pick off and sample the beam. That also gives you the benefit of potentially sampling the beam and still using it simultaneously. So I mentioned the damage threshold charts, the operating space charts that are included with our user, ma user manual. And before you use your nanoscan, you're going to want to make sure that you consult the appropriate chart for the model you've purchased and ensure that you are not going to damage the system. Additionally, uh, for those of you that are trying to integrate a product into your process or your application, we do provide an SDK to do that. Uh, you will need to purchase the nanoscan professional version to do that. And we support, is instead of a .NET SDK, this is an ActiveX-based SDK. And you can use C Sharp, C or C++, LabVIEW, 
Eva VBA and Microsoft Excel. So it's very flexible, has a lot of options uh, to be able to pull that data or results or, or even control the system uh, from your own application. So I wanted to cover a quick application um, that I thought was, that was interesting. This was a custom laser in an atomic forks microscope. And the, the customer was having a bit of issues uh, with the system. The power was adjustable between 0.6 to 1.2 milliwatts with a variable beam size about 4 microns, so 24 to 28 microns. And the beam quality was really critical to being able to resolve the, the surfaces that they were looking at effectively. So we used a NanoScan 1 device. We currently use NanoScan 2s, which is a USB 2 inter interface. Uh, mounted it uh, for two C-mount beam splitters. And the problem that they were dealing with was as the image quality was degrading, so they suspected that the focal point of the laser was not where they expected. And so they were able to move the head vertically and pass the waist of the beam through uh, the now scan and take a series of measurements and found that their uh, focal point was off by about a tenth of an inch. And so the focal point had been expected at about sample 10 on this chart, but it was really at sample 14. You can see how very quickly uh, this only took about 30 minutes to do the measurements, a few more minutes to set it up, and they had the answers they were looking for. And then this was the 1D profiles of how that looked near focus. It was about a 50 micron uh, focal spot. And that also showed that the beam was not uniform in both axes, also degrading some of their measurements. So the, the laser wasn't aligned well anymore and had some an extra lobe of data on the, the left side. The specified power output was about 447 watts at the time, but we, re we reduced that down with those two beam samplers. So in summary, a scanning slit measurement uses a rotating drum. The slits on the drum allow a very small portion of the beam profile to, uh, to pass to the single element sensor, and then we can reconstruct that into a usable beam profiler. There's a much higher damage threshold with these devices and measurement range, and they do require less attenuation than camera-based profilers. But you don't get to see all of the beam all at once, uh, which can be a, a downside. The products that we provide for that are, is the NanoScan V2 software. All of our software you can download and preview on our website for free. The NanoScan 1 and NanoScan 2 scan heads are available with either a pyroelectric, germanium, or silicon sensor depending on what wavelength you're working with. And we have two options available for a 3.5 millimeter aperture. That's the input hole on the front of the device and 1.8 micron slits on the drum or a nine millimeter aperture with five micron slits on the drum. And both of those have different operational ranges. So you want to consult those charts when choosing which to purchase. There are, again, some helpful links. Uh, you can learn more about scanning split profiling. Again, there's a lot more information on our knowledge base, knowledge center on our site, and our YouTube channel. Very often in beam profiling, the question of laser quality comes up. And very often the term, the most commonly used measurement for that is M squared. So we're gonna look at what M squared is and how it's measured why it's so important, and then which, again, which products measure M-squared. Uh, we've already talked about beam width. Uh, laser propagation is the way in which light waves travel along a distance. The laser caustic is the envelope of light rays reflected or refracted by a, a surface, such as a lens. And an M-squared system is gonna be the combination of both software a beam width measurement device like a camera as well as a system whether it's a manual system or an automated system that takes repeated measurements along the propagation of a laser.
all lasers are comprised of some mode content. And that is a particular pattern of, of waves in the electromagnetic field of radiation measured in a cross section. So we're, we're going to slice the beam uh, perpendicular to the way it's traveling, and we're going to take a look at it. And when we do that, we've long known that there are certain patterns that tend to be produced or combinations of patterns that, that merge together to form what our lasers look like. Ideally, a pure Gaussian beam is called a TEM00 beam, and that has an M squared of 1. Technically, you can't get an M squared value less than 1. Mathematically, it is possible, but there are complicated reasons for why that is. So if you ever see that, treat it as equal to 1. So what is M squared? M squared is the ratio of the beam parameter product of an actual beam to that of the ideal Gaussian beam at the same wavelength. And what that means is that when you hear an M squared value stated for a laser, that is a wavelength independent indicator of beam quality. Originally, when M squared was created, it was presented as this option for measuring the quality of a laser, and very rapidly, people assumed that it was the, the only answer that mattered. But in reality, it's just one indicator of beam quality, and there are other things you do need to look at. But it's a really good indicator on its own. It helps you tell how closely mode content of your laser correlates to a pure TEM00 beam, or in other words, how tightly a beam can be focused to achieve a higher power density, how efficient at focusing your laser really is. If it's ideally efficient, then you're going to have a TEM00 beam, and your M squared is going to be equal to 1. But that's not really the real world. The real world, we have lasers of all shapes and sizes and mode content. And so to measure that, we're going to use a focusing lens and then measure the beam widths all the way through after that lens and figure out exactly what it's doing. And then that will help us determine what the laser looks like on the other side of the lens before it was modified by the lens itself. So there are a couple ways of doing this. One is a manual M squared. Our current products do allow you to do a manual M squared run. The laser is aligned parallel to a fixed rail. The user moves the camera back and forth along the rail and you, you're gonna have to input data into the software and it kind of guides you through that measurement. It's a lot easier than trying to do it by hand or, or through a, a completely manual process. And if you want to, you can still enhance that with a motorized rail of your own. To make it easier for everyone that wants to do M squared, um, we build propagation analyzers. Um, our new model is called Beam Squared. It represents a whole new generation of M squared measurement for Ophir Spiricon. Beam Squared has an increased precision of measurement overall made a lot of little changes throughout the system versus our M squared 200S system. We have longer focal length lenses, which give you more operational space to make measurements and improved accuracy. Instead of discrete ND filters, we use a linear attenuation system. So it gives you really smooth, simplified attenuation for more consistent measurements. The beam squared is easier to align to your laser. And the device itself was built a lot more rugged and, and rigid. There's a single piece chassis where all the components are mounted to, so they're not moving around. There's no flex or variability to them. And then it's really flexible in mounting. We designed the beam squared so you can stand it up, uh, which is a first for propagation analyzers. So you can save a lot of table space. Uh, a lot of people don't care if, if things go up above their table. And so that's a really nice option. And the input aperture is the same. So if one day you needed it up out of the way, you can tip it up, remount it, and uh, continue your work. What is inside this mystery box? We've talked about some of the components, that there's a internal attenuator. There's a lens inside. You can see the lens cartridge um, on top here in black. There's a whole lens kit that comes with the systems, uh, so it's really adaptable to what your laser is. 
And then inside there's a series of mirrors. Uh, and it doesn't look like this, but um, the beam does, does bounce around in there. There's this many reflections. And what we're going to do is there's a, a mirror table, one that's stationary and one that moves. So in the manual M squared, we were moving the camera, but those rails tend to be very long and take up a lot of space. And so instead, what the beam square does is it moves a second mirror table back and forth through the, the cavity of the device. And that changes the effective point at which the camera intersects the beam, allowing us to take a variety of measurements without moving anything around your table. So the blue line is the short path, and the green line is the long path of the laser. And this is the beam as it comes from your laser. So like I mentioned, we have built-in attenuation. Um, this is really improved from our previous product, really simplified before our products had discrete filters of specific ND values. And you, uh, the user had to care a lot more about exactly how much attenuation was being used for each measurement. And we've gotten rid of all of that with our new attenuation system. It's all relative. You either have more attenuation or less, and that's all you need to care about. It's really nice. We have an automated stepping mode that automatically determines the measurement locations based on the beam, so it starts analyzing itself and making measurements. Uh, the software controls the mirror stage movement, collects all of the data, computes the measurements all by itself. And all you have to do is input where you, where you want it to start, where you want it to stop, and the interval um, that you hope the measurements will be, at least a starting point for where it's going to, to separate those measurements. We also feature a manual step table mode if you want more control or a very precise repeatability over the M squared runs that you're doing. In this case, you define the table. You can copy that from a previous run using the controls up at the top of the, the step table. And then you build out the table. Once you start the run, the software takes over. Again, it moves the mirror stage, collects all of the data, computes the measurements, makes nice looking graphs on the screen all by itself. The beam squared is about 80% faster than our previous unit. It's really quick. Saves you a lot of time versus our older systems if you've used those. Each of the beam widths is then plotted on a caustic beam display chart. And then we do a mathematical fit to that data. And that helps us obtain the M squared measurements. So you'll see most M squared products should have a view very similar to this. And you can also, if you see a data point that looks like it's, it's, you know, something went wrong, you can double click that and take that out and then still have a, a good measurement without redoing the, the run. We do allow you to view uh, a 3D visualization of the caustic. And that's good for, spot, again, spotting defects and, uh, you know, odd variations. Uh, a little easier to look at than clicking through a bunch of two-dimensional frames. But that is available as well. So in the results display, we have a large variety of measurement results. We have the quantitative results are your 2D, 2D beam profiling results like you would find in beam gauge. Then we provide propagation results for your laser and then the after lens. After lens is what's happening inside of the beam square and then we back calculate out to the real world to help you understand what your laser really is. And then if you're doing real-time adjustments to your laser cavities, you're tuning your lasers, things like that, you can enable a real-time M squared afterwards and you can see how these results update in real time as you make changes to your laser or your optical system. And all of these results can be either enabled or disabled to make it as easy to look at as you need. We also provide beam stability measurement um, with beam squared. So you can do M squared and your stability measurement using the same optical configuration 
and the same software without having to change anything. Now you do have to remove the lens as that's how ISO uh, 11670 states that to be done. So you'll do an M squared run, get that data, pop out the lens, do your stability data, and you're done. So a couple best practices for how to do this. One of the most common things that I see is a customer sending in data and there's 20 or up to 50 samples of their beam. And in reality, you just don't need that much. In fact, ISO 1146-3, which is the section that covers how to do M squared, states that only 10 measurements are really required. And in our automated stepping mode, we'll actually try and do that for you, as well as an 11th point for divergence measurements. And in reality, it's rather easy to show that you really only need 11 to 15 samples to yield the same or better results in a fraction of the time for each run. So if you're using an M squared product currently and you're, you're taking a lot of data, we really recommend you, you eliminate a lot of those points to a distribution very similar to what I've, I've displayed here on screen. You do want to focus a lot of the samples near the waist because that's where it's, it's changing rather rapidly. You want to make sure that we get a good curve fit on the, the data through the waist. And that is one of the key factors to improving the measurement. Oversampling in the near field and the far field can actually um, cause problems with the fit near the waist. One of the other issues we see is when users are not aligning their elliptical beam to the axis of the camera. The beam squared features a rotatable camera mount, so you can turn the camera and align that axis to either the X or Y axis. And the reason we do that is that's really how the measurement was intended to be done. There are some mathematical issues trying to track a beam as it's off axis, and you're really not getting a fair picture of your beam, a fair measurement of your beam through propagation if you're not doing this. Sometimes it's perceived that the laser is actually twisting as it focuses. This is normally a visual effect as non-Gaussian beams start focusing and then expanding again. Sometimes it looks like the beam is kind of doing a twisting motion. Um, it's really kind of a visual effect more than anything. True twisted beams are called generally astigmatic beams and they're not as common at all. Most lasers are simple astigmatic beams and work well with traditional propagation analyzers such as beam squared. If you really have a twisted beam, beam squared features a beam twist result that'll help you determine if that's really happening. And if it is, then you really need a completely separate measurement technique that is covered in an ISO 11146-2 instead of dash three. And that cannot be done with traditional propagation analyzers like beam squared. It's a very unique test procedure that it can't really be done the same way. How can you measure M squared if your laser output is so high it'll damage anything that you put in front of it? So the answer to that is beam watch. This is our patented non-contact beam profiler that uses that it, we're imaging the Rayleigh scatter of your laser off of the air molecules as it passes through the beam watch chamber. You can use this with lasers 400 watts and higher. Currently, there's been no limit found to this device. So if you've got a very powerful laser, we'd love to, uh, to try it out with you. You can measure beams with waists down to 55 microns. It's a really neat device as it truly, there's nothing touching the laser as it goes through the, the device. So there's nothing for it to harm. So here's a diagram of exactly how that's working. We've got uh, specialized cameras and optics inside of the chamber that help us do this. And as the laser waste passes through, it allows us to accurately locate the focus spot and measure M squared. And one of the really cool things is that we can see the focal spot shift over time, which is something that very up until very recently, 
a lot of layers, laser scientists had theorized but hadn't been able to do in real time and actually verify. And with BeamWatch, we've been able to do that. Additionally, if you are in the additive manufacturing markets, we do have a BeamWatch that works for them. It's a calibrated device uh, where you actually set it down in the bin of the manufacturing system, and then the laser enters into the top of the unit, integrates a full BeamWatch imaging system, an Ophir power sensor, and a cooling system all together in a really nice package. You get real-time results, such as waist width and location, focal shift, centroid, M squared, divergence, and so on. So in summary, the products that uh, work here are the beam squared. Uh, one that I didn't talk about much, because uh, it's on the simpler side, it's very similar to the manual M squared system that I mentioned, where you can automate it. Um, it's just very simple. In this system, we're moving a nano scan up and down a rail. Instead of mirrors, we're doing the, the measuring device. And we do have a software package for that, and that is called the nano mode scan. And that's a really great solution for automated M squared measurement using a nano scan. We have the Beam Watch and also the Beam Watch AM. We do have some links if you really want to do a deep dive and learn more about M squared measurement. And that is the end of the module for beam propagation. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to contact us at service at us.ophirop.com. We'd be more than happy to talk to you about your application. And if you're already using our products, thank you very much. And we'd be happy to help you with any issues with our products as well.